Although the DSM-5's mood disorder section contains widely used diagnoses that we're all familiar with, critics raise a number of questions that are really worth considering. Why are there such high rates of comorbidity among mood disorder diagnoses? Comorbidity occurs when patients meet criteria for more than one disorder. The mood disorders are highly comorbid not only with one another, but also with anxiety, post-traumatic stress, substance use, and impulse control problems. So does this mean that the DSM-5 mood disorder diagnoses are conceptually flawed? Some critics think so, but others say this criticism is unfair because comorbidity is also common among many physical illnesses, such as cancer, stroke, and coronary issues. Still, too much comorbidity among mood disorder categories calls into question whether or not they're valid standalone diagnoses. What is the threshold for mood disorder versus quote-unquote normal sadness? Some critics see the DSM-5 mood disorders as having threshold problems, wherein it isn't clear how severe mood symptoms have to be before they qualify someone for a mood disorder diagnosis. People, even mental health professionals, often disagree on where the threshold for disorder lies. Are the DSM-5 depressive and bipolar categories reliable? Recall that diagnostic reliability has to do with how consistently professionals agree on which patients warrant a diagnosis. To a lot of people's surprise, when DSM-5 researchers conducted reliability trials for major depressive disorder, one of the most widely used mood disorder diagnoses, it yielded mediocre reliability, which meant that mental health professionals often disagreed on whether a patient should be diagnosed with major depression or not. Bipolar 1 disorder did noticeably better than major depression in these reliability trials, but disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, a new mood disorder added to DSM-5 and characterized by frequent anger outbursts in children, fared a lot worse. Overall, when it came to reliably diagnosing depression, one study estimated that clinicians only agreed on a diagnosis somewhere between 4 and 15 percent of the time. This is a problem because without reliable diagnosis, it can be really hard to know what interventions are likely to be most helpful. Should the bereavement exclusion have been maintained? In DSM-4, major depression included something called the bereavement exclusion, which was a criterion that discouraged clinicians from diagnosing major depression in people who were grieving the loss of a loved one. The reasoning behind it was that bereavement looks like major depression, but it's really an expected and normal response to grief. Yet some people wondered why a special exclusion was being made for grief, but not other life events things like divorce or job loss. So, some DSM authors wanted to remove the bereavement exclusion from the DSM-5. They argued that depression is depression and that the circumstances don't really matter. However, other DSM-5 authors disagreed and argued that removing the bereavement exclusion improperly pathologized grief and loss. Ultimately, the DSM-5 did remove the bereavement exclusion, but hedged a bit by telling clinicians to use their own judgment in diagnosing bereaved people with major depression. This means that if you go to a therapist while grieving, whether you get diagnosed with major depression or not will depend on whether the clinician supports or opposes the bereavement exclusion. Not exactly the best way to maintain diagnostic reliability, according to DSM-5 critics at least. Why was premenstrual dysphoric disorder added? Premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or PMDD, is diagnosed in women who experience severe mood symptoms during their menstrual periods. The diagnosis has a long and controversial history. The more recent, previous DSMs only listed it as a proposed disorder warranting further study, but it was promoted to an officially recognized disorder in DSM-5. Critics maintain that PMDD is a sexist diagnosis that pathologizes women because it reinforces stereotypes about them being emotionally unstable during menstruation. However, supporters counter that PMDD is a legitimate disorder and that it should only be diagnosed in extreme cases requiring treatment. Why was disruptive mood dysregulation disorder added? We already noted that disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, or DMDD, fared poorly in DSM-5 diagnostic reliability studies. However, it was added to the DSM-5 anyway. How come? Some saw adding DMDD to the DSM-5 as a way to discourage diagnosing children who struggle to regulate their emotions with something called childhood bipolar disorder, which was a diagnosis not found in the DSM but which still became popular among mental health professionals as an unofficial diagnosis. And these mental health professionals often placed the children they diagnosed on powerful antipsychotic drugs. 
So DMDD provides a diagnosis that clinicians can use instead of childhood bipolar, one that potentially discourages use of strong antipsychotic drugs. Still, critics aren't convinced. They see DMDD as a dangerous diagnosis that turns a normal part of childhood, temper tantrums, into a mental disorder. From their point of view, DMDD is unnecessarily pathologizing and encourages the questionable practice of prescribing powerful psychiatric drugs with potentially serious side effects to children. What are your thoughts on the DSM-5 mood disorders?